Shalom and welcome everyone to the Universal Garden of Amuna. I'm Yonatan Galed. You are beautiful people. And we're here in the holy city of Jerusalem in the Chut Shel Chesed Yeshiva, directed by our beloved teacher and spiritual guide, Rabbi Shalom Arush, who is actually the author of this amazing work of art that we are sharing. How are you people? <laughs> Everything's okay? This is so amazing. You know, I hear comments from all kind of people that are learning with us and starting to see changes in their life. And we, we have barely started. So there's a lot of hope and a lot of things to reach yet. So I'm very, very excited. <laughs> I hope you are too. And we have something very special today. But before that, we have a joke, of course, the joke of the day, of the week, whatever. <laughs> it's a question. It's a silly joke, I know, but, uh, uh, you know, to make us smile a little bit. It's a question. Listen carefully. <laughs> this is ridiculous, but we'll do it. How do mountains see? How do mountains see? They peak. <laughs> okay, that was sad. Okay, never mind. They peak, you understand? Okay. If, if Alex understood the, the joke, so we, we all understood. If you have better jokes, you can send this, can send them to us to Yonatan, Y-O-N-A-T-A-N, dot jokes at gmail.com. And you have, if you have any kind of comments, or you are one of the winners of the week's raffle that we will announce in the end of the class, you can write us to Yonatan dot emuna that is e-m-u-n-a at gmail.com excellent so let's continue with our reading with what we're learning we're in we're actually in chapter two because the first chapter is the introduction and we're in chapter two the foundations of emuna the pure faith in the creator of the world now we have spoke about that Every person's got a mission in his life. There's a general mission to all humanity. There's a specific individual mission to each and every one of us. And there's something, something more we need to know. And that's what we'll learn today. That there are a lot of riddles. Riddles in this world. We have spoke about that. And a lot of times we can't understand anything. Things look so confusing, all kind of events, all kind of people that reach us and behave in all kind of ways to us. And we don't understand why. Why do I deserve this? Why is this, this, all of this is happening to me? What's going on here? There's a lot of questions. We, we spoke about that. But there's another piece of information that we are lacking. And if you will have that information, things will be clearer. We'll be able to understand a lot of things. So let's start with the teachings of, of this week. And today we have a story, a true story. And it's really amazing. It's a very strong story. It's, uh, well, you'll see. But I think it can answer a lot of, a lot of questions for each and every one of us. So let's see together. We're, we're in the page number 40, and we're starting. Rectifications. We have spoke about this. A person comes to this world to rectify something, to correct something. Our soul was sent to this world full of darkness to shine, to rectify itself and become completed, to be perfect. And then she can go back to the source. So let's see, we're on page 40, rectifications. As we have mentioned, the belief in the world to come is a foundation of true faith, of emuna. The belief in the world to come, what is called in Hebrew, olam haba. People call it the next world, the spiritual world. Believing in that is a foundation of Emunah. To understand that this world, this physical world, 
is just a station. It's not the purpose, it's a station. It's This world is full of opportunities and ways for us to perfect ourselves before we reach the spiritual world. So let's see. Many rules of life look completely different as soon as a person understands that this world is only a phase of a much greater scheme that started way before the individual was born and is destined to continue after he dies. Now the word, the word death which is a spooky world. <laughs> yeah. We talk about death, that, that's scary, right? Death, to die. We have, we have mentioned this. When a person understands that this is only a station, we talked about it last week, then he's not afraid of death. It doesn't mean he wants to die. It's like waiting, oh, when, when, when will I die? No. It means I'm going to take care and take care of my life Every second of my life, I will dedicate it to the purpose, to rectify myself. I won't let myself waste this life. I'm not going to ruin this opportunity I have here. This is only a station. And whatever I can pick up in this station, I will carry it forever. So instead of wasting my time on nonsense, I will try to do the correct work, spiritual work, that I have to do in this place. And actually, <laughs> what we're doing here is exactly that. We want to live our purpose. So, we don't need to be afraid of the concept of death. Because that means only that we finished a stage. We left the station towards a greater, eternal life. So let's make the most of this life, of life in this station that is called Olam Hazeh, this world, the material, physical world. Now, Rabbi Chaim Vital, the prime disciple of the father of Kabbalah, true Kabbalah, not the ones you need to pay and pay and pay, and all kind of, talking real Kabbalah that is taught from teacher to student after the person learned the entire Torah. It's not like this you can learn on YouTube, you know, Kabbalah. That's nice, you know, for other purposes. But true Kabbalah, the father of true Kabbalah was known as the Ari, the Ari HaKadosh, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria Ashkenazi. His great disciple, Rabbi Chaim Vital, relates the following story that he heard, he himself heard from his teacher and spiritual guide, the Ariya Kadosh. A true story about a tragedy. Sorry about that. <laughs> There's also tragedies in life, but we need to learn from them. So, can, so we can make this life much happier. So he relates the story. A true story about a tragedy which jolted the very foundation of an entire community's faith, Amuna, in the creator of all worlds. So let's see. Let's read the story. The conclusions are already built in. And we'll take this message for every second of our lives. Because with the messages we'll receive from this story, things are going to look much clearer. We can understand much more about our lives. And we can enjoy life. We have a satisfying, sweet life that's actually what we want. So let's read it. This is a story again by the Ariya Kadosh Rabbi Yitzchak Luri Ashkenazi that he told it to his disciple Rabbi Chaim Vital. And now we're sharing, sharing it together here. A beautiful young lady, daughter of one of the community's most prestigious and respected families, married a righteous merchant, a man of charity and compassion. Sounds perfect. The early years of their marriage were blessed with happiness, abundance, and children. The modest wife became a wonderful mother, utilizing every free minute of her busy schedule to pray or to care for the community's poor. 
she, she used to do what we call in Hebrew chesed. Chesed, loving kindness, acts of loving kindness. So she used to pray, to read the Psalms, Tehillim, or to care for the community's poor and underprivileged people. The husband, whose su successful commer commerce carried him to surrounding cities and hamlets, gave enormous amounts of charities all across the country. They didn't just work for the money <laughs> to be rich, they helped other people. So he used to give charities all across the country, easing the suffering of thousands of peoples, thousands of impoverished people, poor people. He used to give them money, help them, and not, not only with money, with a good word, sometimes with a hug, you know, sometimes you can give charity, you know, to do a, an act of loving kindness without money, without a credit card. Just hug someone that needs it. Your fellow man, a person that is in pain, they did just that. They helped everyone they could. But suddenly, disaster struck. Boom! Their home, a bright beacon of charity, good deeds and loving kindness, became the scene of agony. A drunken stranger, soldier, viciously attacked, mutilated, and murdered the couple's three-year-old son. Oh, out of nowhere, their son was murdered. A three-year-old son, a pure angel. The entire community was appalled. Everyone was in shock. No one could believe it. Thousands came to console the grief-stricken parents, including the nation's leading scholars and, scholars and spiritual leaders. Everybody came to try to strengthen, to help the family. But no one understood. No one understood. How can it be? How can it be? Many vocalized the doubts in their hearts in public. Is this the reward? Is this the reward that such a righteous couple deserves? This is what they get for helping every needy person they, they, they come across? This is the prize? Why did the Creator, why did God do something so horrendous like that to them. Why did a poor little toddler have to suffer so severely? What did he do? An innocent child. What is this? Where's justice here? What's going on? This is crazy. Others harbored malice in their hearts against the Creator, against God, which weakened their faith and distanced them from Him. They started losing their emuna, the pure, simple faith in the, in the Creator. But listen to this. Despite the indescribable pain, the couple reacted with total emuna. Total emuna. Capitulation and loving acceptance of the divine decree. They continued with their righteous lifestyle as if nothing had changed. What amazing people. They just continued. The, the wife with her acts of loving kindness and the husband with his spiritual growth and magnificent charity. They continued their life like nothing had happened. Of course, they had the pain. They felt the loss, but they decided we, we, we're going to continue. We're going to live on and continue with our good deeds. Amazing. An example to everyone. But shortly thereafter, tragedy struck again. Again. What? Like wildfire, 
word spread around the town that the righteous merchant had fallen deathly ill. He's dying. The father of this little child, the husband of this young woman, is deathly ill. All the local synagogues mobilized their members in round-the-clock prayer vigils, praying without stops. Tehillim, Psalms, being read. People tearing heavens with their prayers. Please, King of the Universe, help this husband. They just lost their child. Save them, help them. Help this husband, have mercy on his wife, on all the other children, please. Everyone loved the merchant. Almost every person in town had benefited from his generosity at one time or another. <laughs> Understandably, the cries of the community pierced the very thresholds of the heavens. So, what are we expecting? Good news, right? But not everything works exactly the way we expect. The pain and bewilderment of the entire town reached new heights when word of the righteous merchant's death became common knowledge. Such a young man, at the prime of his life, didn't he suffer enough? He's losing his little child, his little son, in such a brutal way. A lot of questions. He did nothing but good deeds his entire life. He helped everyone. He's the last person I would expect something bad will happen to him. You know how many wicked people are you know, all around us? People that hurt each other, hurt others, use their, their money, their wealth to do bad. This person was the opposite. He just helped and helped on his own expense. The money he earned, he gave to others. So what is this? What is, what is going on here? How many times we ask these questions about ourselves, things that happen in our life or other people's life? What's going on? Can there be an answer to all of this? Doesn't sound like it, right? Let's see. The tears of the young, barely 35-year-old widow tore at the community's already perplexed and agonized heart. Everyone in the community felt a personal loss. Everyone. No one understood why such a good and righteous husband and father was plucked from their midst. What happened to all of the community's prayers? Didn't they help at all? Nothing. Saying words. We were praying and praying. No, just words. Nothing happened. Looks like a waste of time. Of energy. What's for? What, what, what was all of this for? Two years passed. Two years. One evening, the newly married son of the young widow came to visit his mother and ask how she was feeling. She tried to smile, but burst into tears. Mama, the young man pleaded. Two years have passed already from that tragedy. Mother, please, you've cried enough. Our forefathers prescribed set times for mourning. If someone cries more than they should, the sore never leaves them. The sages teach us that. If a person continues with the mourning and the sadness, then he's actually damaging, hurting himself. He's bringing on himself more and more sadness. It's dangerous. And we understand why also. So he told her, we are people of Emuna. We are believers, true believers, mother. 
None of us can comprehend divine considerations, but we believe that everything God, the creator of the universe, Hashem, does is for the very best. Even though we can't understand it, we can't see it, we can't feel it, but we should believe it. Mama, your crying not only saddens us, your remaining children, but it saddens Papa's soul too. I'm sure he's not happy to see you like this. He's watching over us, he's looking at us, and he sees you with so much pain. You think that makes him happy? You know, Mother, I know it's hard to say it, but it's been only two years, but you need to go on with your life. The matchmakers have been chasing after you with several good proposals, so you can start a new life. And you've been avoiding them. Mama, please, I beg you, you must continue on with your life. We are, chi your children want it for you. We want you to marry again. We want you, you are young. We want to see you happy. And I'm sure Father wants that also for you. The young widow took a deep breath. And she decided, enough, enough, enough with this crying. Enough with this mourning, with this suffering. Enough. She made a firm resolve to overcome the sorrow. An encouraging thought flashed across her mind. And listen to this thought that should, should be present in our lives always, especially in the hard times. Listen to this. She made a firm resolve to overcome the sorrow. An encouraging thought flashed across her mind. Am I more merciful than God? Am I more merciful than God, than the Creator, the one who created <laughs> all the good things? He's the master of having love towards his children of everything. Mercifulness. He is the master of that. Am I more merciful than God? Of course not. Of course not. I've always trusted in Him. So why shouldn't I be happy? If He did that to me, it was with love. In a merciful way, which I can't comprehend. I can't. But I can trust in Him. Have faith in Him. And then, to the relief of her worried children, that very day, mother became a new person. This young lady changed completely. This was the very best thing that could have happened in their lives, the lives of her, of her children. For the first time in two years, the widow fell asleep with a smile on her lips. With a smile. <laughs> she slept soundly and peacefully. She realized that her lack of true faith, her lack of emuna, not her hus husband's absence, the lack of emuna was responsible for the gap in her heart. And now the gap was filled again. Filled again with what? With emuna. The pure, simple faith in the Creator. That He does everything. And everything that He does is for the best of each and every one of us. She began trusting in Him again. Relying on Him. Believing in Him. And she could sleep with a smile for the first time in two years. And then she had a dream. Now listen to this. The answers are on their way. She saw herself standing in an exotic garden of supernatural beauty. And she understood this must be the next world. Heaven, paradise, whatever you call it. 
Standing among the aromatic flowering trees, she saw an image of an old man with a long beard who radiated brilliantly. Who is that? He approached her and asked if she'd like to see her deceased husband. Of course, she nodded in affirmative. He led her to a magnificent palace where a young man was giving a deep spiritual lecture to thousands of elderly righteous souls. Thousands of souls. And this young man is giving them classes of emuna, of Torah, spiritual guidance. What is that? When the lecture was over, suddenly the lecturer approached her. And it was her husband. She couldn't believe it. Young, strong, shining, smiling. My husband, my dearest husband, she hugged him. She, was, she couldn't believe it. Dearest husband, she ex exclaimed. I can't believe I'm seeing you. But why? Why did you leave me alone at such an early stage in our lives? Why? And how have you become the teacher of so many righteous souls? <laughs> With all due respect, you were a merchant. A simple man, a righteous man, an upright man. But you weren't never a clergyman or scholar that you can teach others. You were a good person, really, but not a spiritual guide or teacher. What's going on here? I don't understand a thing. The husband smiled. Indeed, I was. I was a great scholar. But that was in a previous life. I was a great scholar in my previous life. But in that life, I never married. Never. I was told that I needed to fulfill the first biblical commandment. Nam namely, to be fruitful and multiply. After I finished that past life, I was incomplete. Because I, I didn't fulfill the first biblical commandment to marry and have children. Therefore, I was born for the sole purpose of marrying and having children and to raise them in the path of truth, the path of Torah, of Emunah. And that's exactly what I did. I married you. I was blessed with a righteous woman like you. We got married, we had children. And as soon as I completed my mission on earth, I no longer had to remain down there. Now, as you see, I live a life of eternal bliss thanks to my completed mission and the Muna that I learned along the way. Yes, but I don't understand, said the wife, but then why didn't all the prayers that the community prayed do any good for you? Didn't save you? All the prayers, all the hours of Tehillim, of Psalms being recited was all wasted. They, they, they were useful. They weren't useful. For nothing, probed the wife. The husband answered, oh no, they did. They did do good for me and not only for me, he told her. All the pray prayers were accepted, all of them. Some of them helped elevate me to my current lofty station in heaven. Some were used for the good of others that needed them. And some of the prayers were used to rescind harsh decrees 
from over our community and other people's lives. But I finished my task on earth, so I didn't have to stay in the lowly physical world any, any longer. I was done. I completed my mission. It looks like the prayers weren't effective, but they were. No prayer goes to waste. They were effective. They were heard and received in their entirety. Since my job was over, I had to leave the physical world. But you, my wife, you still have a job to do. You must go on. You must continue in life. You must remarry, have more children, and raise our children. Your mission on earth is far from over. You need to continue. She was quiet. But then she asked. But, okay, okay. But why? Why did our little son die? Okay, you explained me about you, okay. But our little baby boy, three years old, it's, it's still a baby, it's a young little kid. Why did he die? You have an explanation for that too? The husband replied, I want you to know, our son, listen carefully, he was a lofty, angelic soul who had completed his soul correction while being three years old. Three years old, he completed his soul correction? Yes. Why? Because this boy, in his former life, as a baby in the crib, he was kidnapped by a group of robbers and killers who sold babies. Before an upright couple purchased him and raised him to the righteous person who he became. But before that, he had nursed from one of the robber's wives, a nasty and wicked woman. woman. A nasty and wicked woman. After his death, he wanted to take his rightful place in heaven. He worked hard in his, his entire life to be righteous, to do good. But then, after he passed away, he wanted to receive his place in heaven. But he had a bad blemish on his soul from the time he nursed from the wicked woman's milk. It blemished his soul. So, he had the, oppor the opportunity, received another chance to return to the world for the sole purpose of nursing from a righteous woman. From a good woman that does only good with others. And you are the fortunate righteous woman who was chosen for that task. The Creator chose you for the soul correction of this pure soul. And not only that, but you. But by virtue of your modesty and righteousness, we're granted the tremendous privilege of giving birth to the tender little baby who housed such an enormously righteous soul. You were chosen for that. But I don't understand, said the wife, the young lady. But why was his death, his death so horrible? Why did he have to die like that? The mother cried in anguish, reminded of the horrific way that her baby was murdered. Our son, said the husband, was destined to die anyway. In that exact day, in that exact hour, it was his time to leave the world. For he had completed his mission and soul correction on earth. The heavenly court had decreed in light of the dire sins between men and fellow men in our town, that all its inhabitants be destroyed in a catastrophic pogrom. There was bad things happening in our town, 
between one man and his fellow man, hurting each other. And there was a decree against the people. A terrible pogrom that would have killed hundreds of people. But the righteous soul of our little one, of this boy, volunteered, chose to volunteer to die a terrible death as atonement for the entire town. That through his death, people will get spiritually awakened, will understand that life is short, and they must do good with one each other, with one another, with each other, to wake them up from all these terrible sins that they're doing, cheating on one another, lying, talking, slander, hurting, this tragedy made everybody stop. Wake up. What are you doing? Do you understand, do you understand life is a serious business? You can just hurt others. When a little child like that dies, everybody, whoa, oh, hold on. Start thinking. Start doing a soul correction. If they had, if they have that blessing of opening their eyes and look what's happening. Not like they want to start asking more questions. The one that start thinking and understanding, looking around and saying something needs to be changed. So this soul, this lofty soul decided, chose to die in this way, to save the entire town, hundreds of people. To die is an atonement for the entire town. He became a righteous martyr and sanctified himself as a public sacrifice. Because by his death, people woke up spiritually after all the questions and everything that was happening, people understood that they start, they need to start making changes. Loving each other, helping each other. They became united. They started doing things for others. And he actually saved them. And now, no one is allowed to reach his lofty abode, his lofty abode except for me, since I was, since I was his father. And when your time comes, you as his mother will also be allowed. You can't imagine the bliss of the divine light which surrounds our son. You don't know the, what he reached spiritually. And that's, telling, and that's what the husband that was in such a lofty level tells the mother. He that is in the, I don't know, he reached such a high level, he is allowed sometimes to go up to see to visit his son that is in a much higher place. The husband faded away. Before he departed, his voice rever reverberated and he said, Only by virtue of your reinforced the moon I was I revealed to you. As long as you were in a cloud of sadness, you almost lost another child. All my requests to be revealed to you were refused. My mission on earth has been completed, but you still have much to do. Go, remarry, and live a life of emuna and joy. Go with my blessing. Farewell. The husband's image disappeared completely. The widow awakened. She felt like she was born anew. She realized that her questions, as well as the, as the rest of the town's questions, and ours hopefully, were needless. If the Torah, the Bible, teaches us that the Creator is righteous and just, then there's no need to wonder why He does what He does. Because He knows what He's doing. And he's doing, he's doing it for our benefit even though we can't understand it as we will learn 
Those of us who don't marry revelations in our sleep, like me, <laughs> should strive to strengthen our Muna. The knowledge that the Creator does everything for our eternal benefit should be engraved in our hearts and minds. This is very emotional. I have also something very personal about this story, but I, I think I will tell you that in the future. <laughs> I know some people can hear this and say, what? But why? Why like this? And what? We're just in the beginning. We just started learning. But we must understand one thing. There's someone that is directing everything. That everything in it is in his hands and wants only the best for us. Even though we can't understand his actions. We also can't understand exactly how electricity works if, we, if we're not scientists, right? You don't understand how a brain surgery works if you're not a big uh, doctor, right? So what the creator does, which is much more than, than anything a scientist or a doctor can do, no human being can understand. But we can do one thing. Trust in Him. Believe in Him. Our Father knows what He's doing. And I'm just a little child. Look at Him. Depending on Him. Trusting in Him and believing in my Father. That we'll, He will do the best for me. And when we live like that, life is the most beautiful thing in the world. It's an amazing garden. A garden of Amuna. So... The homework for this week, I think it's, you know, to think a little bit about, about what we've learned. And as we did before, think a little bit about things that happened in our lives and think how I can see it differently now with this story. And start asking from the Creator, from Hashem, God Almighty, that will help us have a Muna, pure and simple faith in Him, to start trusting in Him and living an amazing, sweet life. And now, doo -doo -doo, as we do with our virtual trumpet, <laughs> we're going to announce the winner of this week. And, oh, he's from Sweden. <laughs> I hope I'll read your name correctly, my friend. Jeffrey, that I can read, Linderwichten. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry, my friend. I don't know how to read it. Jeffrey Linderwichten. Okay? I'm so sorry about uh, not saying it correctly, but Jeffrey, Jeffrey L. <laughs> That'll be the best. Jeffrey L. Linderwicht from Sweden. You just won the book, The Universal Garden of Emuna. And we will send it to you if you will write us to Jonathan.emuna at gmail.com with all your details and address and whatever and we'll send you the book you deserve it but the biggest prize you know what it is people beautiful people you are beautiful people one day i will explain to you exactly why if you don't know already you know what the biggest prize is when we can share together this divine knowledge and live according to it that's the biggest prize so if you're watching this series, this spiritual workshop, taking it to practice, then we won the lottery. The biggest prize. So let's start working on ourselves. Let's start smiling. Because Daddy, <laughs> Big Daddy, <laughs> our Father in Heaven, loves us, cares for us, wants the best for us. And we will learn how to live correctly, continue learning, and till the next time, I wish us all to see this world rectified with the light of Amuna, and may we, may we be able to meet next week with a smile, healthy and happy, and see very soon a perfect world, speedily, and in our days. Amen.